Well, good day, everybody. This is uh, Chris with the Ancient Scholar, and today what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about a uh, another class of chemical weapons agents, and these agents are the vesicants. And the vesicants are a rather large, but um, not particularly diverse class of agents. And the um, vesicants, uh, vesicant means to produce blisters. So these are sometimes known as the blistering agents. Of, of which I have a molecular model of the um, prototypical um, vesicant. This is what's known as a sulfur mustard. Um, so you have a sulfur atom and you have two ethyl groups here, which are two carbons. Um, so you have this, two ethyl groups, and then you have uh, chlorine atoms sticking off the end of these uh, carbons here. And this makes up the fundamental, this is basically the fundamental structure of most of your, your, your vesicants. You can modify this a little bit. Um, I could replace this with a um, nitrogen, and, and we'd call that a nitrogen mustard. And, and perhaps I even have a nitrogen here. Let me grab my little molecular model set here. All right. So I could just as easily replace this with a nitrogen and then I could have, of course, nitrogen can um, can un uh, can undergo three covalent bonds versus the two here that I have of sulfur. So you could replace that with nitrogen and you could have a, a third group like a methyl group or, you know, an aromatic ring or something else coming off that nitrogen. And we would call that a nitrogen mustard. Um, this just happens to be a sulfur mustard, um, so we'll stick with this. So this uh, sulfur mustard is the active ingredient in something known as mustard gas. Um, it has the um, military designation of H and HD, and I believe that um, H is kind of an impure, in, in impure form, uh, which is weaponized, and HD is, is more purified. In its pure form, a sulfur sulfur mustard like this um, is a pretty much a clear, colorless, odorless, viscous um, liquid at room temperature, at least. And it only takes on kind of a more oily, um, darker appearance um, when it is not as purified as some of the other forms. But it's still kind of a viscous, oily substance. Um, so when we say mustard gas, that's probably not the 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 the, um, all, the common state that we would find this agent in if it was used. It's more of a liquid, more like um, VX, which is something I'll be talking about next week, actually. Um, so it's a good what we call area denial agent, where you could um, spread this agent in a certain area, and it, it's kind of viscous and, and sticky, and it, it sticks around, and, and it prevents troops from moving into um, certain areas. Um, now, if you heat it up enough, it can vaporize. Um, it's, uh, it is, see here, a couple hundred degrees Celsius, I believe, is um, what would, so if you, you know, if you detonate it in a weapon that can get, you know, relatively warm, which a couple hundred degrees Celsius isn't too hot, um, you can vaporize it and you can have some inhalation, but the the typical hazard with uh, the mustard uh, agents are uh, tend to be more dermal dermal exposure. You get the blisters. You can get some inhalation sometimes, and sometimes you can get in, into the uh, the the mucosal membranes of the mouth and eyes. Um, so both sulfur and nitrogen mustards are what we call alkylating agents, and um, they primarily alkylate, or their primary problem is they alkylate with nucleic acids, DNA, um, in the nucleus of the cell. Um, these are not particularly water soluble, but they are uh, fairly lipid soluble, uh, so these can penetrate membranes pretty easily and get into the cell. They can alkylate with uh, DNA. Um, and when they do that, they bind to the DNA strand that disrupts the DNA structure, and of course that leads to um, can lead to severe mutations, cellular injury, cellular uh, death. And um, one of the primary ways that these mustards work is um, through this alkylation method, where you actually have something known as an intramolecular nucleophilic substitution, um, where you have uh, sulfur here donating electrons. Okay, to this electronegative uh, guy here, the um, 
uh, chlorine and the chlorine comes off and then this and then there's a kind of a cyclic um, bond here I can't really do it but something kind of like that um, it comes together and this here becomes ionic I believe it has a plus two it's a plus two ion it's a highly reactive ion really good at, at active uh, reacting or alkylating as we say with uh, nucleic acids in, in that particular ion form and that is known as a cyclic or cyclic sulfonium ion it's highly reactive um, and like I said, it really likes to alkylate and react with um, endogenous um, amine molecules that have the amine in NH2 group in them. Um, so uh, that is one major mechanism. A secondary, secondary mechanism is, you know, these are going to do some oxidative stress. So you're going to have some oxidative stress developing. Um, and these are, of course, mutagenic, which makes them carcinogenic. And some people even call the um, mustards uh "Quote unquote chemical radiation because it's very similar to being exposed to ionizing radiation, where ionizing radiation comes in and disrupts the DNA strand and it causes um, cellular injury through disruption of, of DNA primarily. Um, very similar to the uh, mechanism of action of these alkylating agents. Um, so you have sulfur mustards, you have nitrogen mustards, and then you can actually, um, if you have a sulfur mustard, you can do some uh, modifications uh, to this a little bit, um, and you can also modify your nitrogen mustards a little bit, um, but these still is, a, is the uh, primary structure. Uh, in addition to sulfur mustards and nitrogen mustards, there are two other agents that are that are considered uh, vesicants, and that is uh, lewisite and phosgene oxine. Um, uh, lewisite contains arsenic, and um, phosgene um, oxine is a um, chlorinated, it's chlorinated like this, it has a carbon-nitrogen double bond and a hydroxyl group in it. Um, so all three of these agents, to uh, some extent, work as um, as uh, alkylating or as um, um, not necessarily alkylating agents, but as vesicants, excuse me, as vesicants, uh, blister forming, um, most notably the uh, sulfur and nitrogen mustards. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about being exposed particularly to sulfur mustard uh, because that's kind of the prototypical um, agent that we'll talk about. Um, these agents are, do not have a particularly high mortality associated with them. Um, rather, they have high morbidity. That means that they um, cause lots of problems and they are highly disabling, um, debilitating. They cause these large blisters, these yellowish blisters that are full of um, fluid. Um, coincidentally, the fluid inside of the, um, the blisters or the bullae or these bullae, bullae or bullae, um, are multiple large um, blisters, um, vesicles, or these smaller blisters. But these blisters, uh, the fluid inside of them, um, you know, it's inflammatory. So there's a lot of eosinophils that gives it that yellowish color. Um, that is not, uh, if, if, if that if fluid were to get on somebody, aside from your infection issues, um, that fluid is not particularly toxic. Uh, the at that point, the mustards have already done what they're going to do, um, and it's not actually the mustard agent inside of that that blister. Some people seem to think that the agent's floating around in there, and the blisters pop. That agent will get on you. That's that's not not at all the case. So the nitrogen mustards have already done, or, or sulfur mustards um, have done their damage, and the blister formation is a result of that damage and the inflammation and the apoptosis and necrosis and all the uh, the uh, pathology that's occurring there. Um, now, interestingly enough, the um, mustards, particularly the sulfur mustard, is uh, very delayed in its, its onset. So you can be exposed to this, and it can take several hours, not unlike a, a, a severe radiation injury, where it may take several hours for signs and symptoms to manifest. So um, it's very insidious. You can be exposed to this, not necessarily know what's going on. In several hours, you, you have... Um, these blisters develop and this pain and this very severe um, debilitation that results as uh, that 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 occurs as as a result of being exposed to these particular agents. Um, I should also say that the mustards have seen more 
um, contemporary use as uh, chemotherapeutic agents uh, because they are so good at alkylating. Um, they're so good at alkylating with um, DNA that when you have cells that are rapidly dividing and when you have lots of rapidly dividing cells, uh, their, their DNA it tends to be more exposed and so that those are prime those types of cells are prime targets for alkylating agents and so these agents um, are also used um, the mustards nitrogen uh, primarily a, a lot of your nitrogen mustards and to some extent uh, sulfur mustards are used as chemotherapy agents specifically for um, certain types of lymphoid cancer um, Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma not Hodgkin's lymphoma um, and some other things they, they've been used for those types of cancers um, so there is some contemporary medical, there are some contemporary medical uses for these agents. Um, in addition to that, these agents, in addition to the local effects that you might see, the blistering, um, particularly the blistering, um, occurs between the epidermal and dermal layers of the skin. So you have your epidermis, which is your outer, your dermal, kind of in the middle. Then you have the subcutaneous layer, which is underneath that, contains the fat. And then you have your fascial layer, um, which uh, surrounds your, your muscle bundles. Um, but in addition to that, there are systemic effects, particularly with the alkylating agents uh, like uh, the sulfur nitrogen mustards. And these systemic effects can include uh, uh, alterations associated with the immune system. Because the immune system, you have uh, you know, cells that are dividing, and uh, particularly your white cells. And your, your white cells may be uh, more prone to uh, developing um, damage there. Uh, so you can have um, some potential long-term uh, immunological effects. In addition to that, there may be an increased long-term risk for the development of certain cancers in patients that have been exposed to these agents. So that's always something that you need to um, uh, really think about in patients when you talk about chronic therapy there. Um, so let's go ahead and what I want to do is I want to talk just real quickly um, a little bit about the um, other agents, uh, lewisite and phosgene. Um, in general, there aren't really good um, antidotes that we have for these particular agents. Um, there may be like a high... Um, high you know, you can go to Wikipedia and it talks about some, some antidotes that you may be able to apply real quickly. I'm not aware of real significant evidence that suggests any of that stuff really works. In a lot of cases, you don't even know you've been exposed. And, and by the time you start developing um, significant signs and symptoms, you're really not going to um, make any difference with any kind of the uh, antidote type things. Um, some people say that maybe sodium thiosulfate, if administered very quickly, may, may be helpful. Um, I, again, I'm not particularly aware of robust data that suggests that is. Uh, obviously, decontamination of the skin is going to be very important with any type of, uh, of exposure, particularly because these agents are so um, viscous. So soap and water may be much more helpful than just you know uh, irrigating with water like we might do with uh, other agents. So that's just those are just some things to um, uh, think about there. So when we talk about managing the patient, most of our management is going to be um, revolving around supportive care, good wound care, good decontamination. Um, treat these a lot like a burn patient, so they're going to be high risk for infection. They're going to be very uncomfortable, so we'll need to make sure that we provide good um, analgies, uh, uh, cover them for good pain control. Um, I want to do. I want to specifically talk about phosgene and lewisite. Um, phosgene is interesting in that um, it begins, the signs and symptoms are more, uh, you, you kind of have this pain and you can kind of get like this red um, little ring and hive-like formation. So phosgene is interesting. It doesn't go right to blisters. You actually get this urticaric, this itchy, hivey kind of rash that develops mm, within a half an hour to an hour of, of exposure. And then that progresses to more extensive skin damage. Um, lewisite, um, lewisite is a little different from the mustards as well. Um, generally, exposure to lewisite can cause pain um, very quickly. You know, within you know a few minutes of, of contact. Um, so that really is more characteristic of, of lewisite. Um, 
So there you have uh, your major agents. Um, there have been, there is one particular antidote I, I suppose I should mention. There are really no real antidotes for the mustards, but um, there is something called Ball or British anti-lewisite agent that was developed as a um, sort of um, uh, antidote, if you will, it can be used to treat that. Uh, again, um, the, uh, how robust is the evidence supporting that ball therapy is, is really, really good? I'm not sure. Uh, but across the across the board, good therapy is really going to revolve around identifying um, what's going on, decontamination, and good good supportive and good wound care. Clearly, inhalational injuries and injuries associated with the mucous membranes in the eyes are going to have very special considerations um, associated with them as well. Okay, guys, it's 15 minutes. Just a brief introduction to the um, the vesicants or the blister-producing agents, um, of which you can really it really comes down to the four. It comes down to the sulfur mustard, the nitrogen mustard, and then um, it, you have lewisite and phosgene oxine. Okay, guys, um, as always, thanks for hanging in there.